Welcome, everybody. We want to look at the pandemic through the lens of the spiral, and our guests are Lauren Laubsche and uh, John Freeman. And I'm, let's say, the inviter of these two, because my intention for today is to bring Lorraine into the awareness of the integral community. She, as it's often happening, women are behind the men working hard, but don't get the recognition and don't get the, in, into the front light. And that was happening to Lorraine because she worked with Don Beck to, in South Africa to bring apartheid to an end without a bloodshed. So I was very much interested in doing this with her. I had her on the Wisdom Factory. Oh, I didn't say who I am. I'm Heidi Hernlein and I'm uh, doing video podcasts on the Wisdom Factory and I'm interviewing integral oriented people. And I have done with John several sessions and also with Lorraine. And it's wonderful to have you here now. Uh, I'm in the integral community since 2000 or even earlier in the German community first, German speaking community. And then finally, I found people with whom I could talk about the books of uh, Ken Wilber, you know, because here around me, I'm living in Italy in beautiful Paradiso Integrale. You can find it out on, on uh, Google. Uh, I couldn't find anybody. And so now being so much connected with everybody of you, that's just, just wonderful. During the years I uh, founded, I developed something which I called integral voice training because I'm a, a classical singer. At least I was, I don't sing anymore and so much. And um, later with my husband, Mark Davenport, I founded the Wisdom Factory as a place for integralists to show their work to uh, be public with it. And uh, at a certain moment, um, we also started the Conscious Aging series, where it was all about aging. We did yesterday a um, review of that. And this here would be some conversations that really matter because what is happening in the world now is a big deal. And so that's why I connected with Lorraine and John to keep the conversation going because they are specialists in, uh, in spiral dynamics. I know spiral dynamics, but I'm not so deep in. So I leave the conversation to, to them. And when you ask questions, please ask them afterwards. Or you can type them also in the chat box during the session. Before we start, I tell you a little bit about Dr. Lorraine Laubscher. She is one of the most experienced users of spiral dynamics globally. She is renowned for her ability to apply spiral dynamics practically and with lasting results. Lorraine wrote her PhD when she was 83, the result of her lifelong experience with working with spiral dynamics and of her collaboration with Don Beck in South Africa, the country with which she is intimately familiar. Her easy and accessible communication style enables her to share sound and practical problem solving, thinking and conflict resolution skills with employees at all levels in an organization. Her in research interests include effective workplace forums, diversity management, personal and organizational change. Lorraine has presented many papers at conferences in North and South America, as well as in South Africa. I got to know her actually last year at the Integral African Conference in Johannesburg. And now some words about John. He says, he is a radical thinker, leading the mindset shift into the second tier world. He is one of the world's leading trainers in spiral dynamics. He is a consultant in organizational development and the creator of personal development products. John's book, The Science of Possibility, is a groundbreaking exploration of the new reality and reinventing capitalism, the only full four quadrant approach to money. His new trainings in intuition and creating new reality can be explored through the Facebook Access to Possibility group. I will send you the links later in the chat. And now let's go on what is happening in this world. Lorraine, you were uh, so keen to talk about 
these things which are happening in the last few days. Would you come on and mute yourself and, and come in? Or maybe I can do that. Let me see if she knows how, how it works. Yeah, she is unmuted. So Lorraine, come over. Can you hear me now? Yes, but you must still put on your camera. You know where that is? Oh, no, I don't. No, go I don't. Your, yeah, go with your cursor down in this window where you see your name on. And there is a symbol of a camera. And you have to click on that. The recording. Uh, no, no, left. on the left, on the left. At the, the bottom. Second, yeah. There's first a microphone and then there is a video. Click on the video. Yeah, video CD FaceTime. No, no, you can choose virtual. Okay, no, I don't know where to click. Bottom of the black window. Yeah. Pardon, the bottom? Here you are, here you are. Wonderful. There you go. Done it. <laughs> you are here, so that's okay. good. Okay, now I'm going to have to get up and go and switch off the lights because that's no good. Yeah, no, leave it's it. It's okay, just, don't worry. It's okay, just put your, your computer in a way that we see a little bit more of you and a little bit less of the lamps on top. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Let's turn it around a little bit. Okay, uh, we made it. Everything was doable. All right. Now, we want to talk about the pandemic, but look what's happened in the meantime. Look what's happened. The ha looks like half of America is now running around in the streets and making fires. And it's not bright place, as we call it down here, where we, when we grow meat on an open fire. There, it's just burning everything for the sake of burning. Why is this happening? Why is it? It was predicted, and when, I'm not going to go into all the places that it was predicted, but let's look at what is actually happening. You have the purple, the beige. The beige is uh, not that involved at the moment. Uh, I think Trump has gone perhaps into beige a bit. He's not doing anything about it. It's just quiet. And we all know that beige is, is a very quiet, it's got drugs in it, it's all those kind of things. But the purple, the purple is important here because we've got to remember this is African-Americans. And don't think that you're African. Because you're African, it just goes away when you get to American shores. There are belief systems. There are all kind of things that you come across that you cannot just wash it out. It is important, just as if we look back historically, when parts of Europe were purple, and eventually it will work out, but not until we do something about it now. What we need is to have the blue, well, I've talked about purple, let me talk about the red. The red you can see, whatever is coming in from the side and whatever love, red loves fire. Oh, it loves the fire. Don't ever have, if you have a red child, don't ever give them a box of matches. Really, they will light anything you have in your house. So, the red is there. You've seen the red operating. Remembering that in both in the systems, you get bad and positive, negative and positive in each of them. So, when you listen to the television today and you heard all the sort of ministers and everything, black lawyers talking, you hear them talking positive purple, positive red, positive blue. But when you see the youngsters, 
there was one youngster that said he just wants it that he can go and walk and that he won't be afraid because that somebody's going to arrest him or check his pockets or stop him or anything else. So that is a purple fear of red. Now we have another difficulty because what's happened with the police who should have been blue? You remember when I was young, there was always the bobby on the beat. You, mommy used to always say, if there's any trouble, look for a policeman, ask the policeman. And we knew what a policeman helmet looked like. <clears throat> remember that South Africa was very British. Then what happened? with the blue, with the policemen. The police in all those cities, a section of them has become low red. And low red enjoys the violence, enjoys it, gives them. You could see that that man with his foot on that guy's neck was not upset. I almost thought he was enjoying himself. And so you will look at these systems. Now we get the mayors and they're all talking orange because they see that, that everything's got to be rebuilt now and it's expensive. And with the pandemic, the corona, I can't pronounce it, forget it. With the disease that is now jumping everywhere, uh, there's the money being swallowed for people that have lost their job. There's money everywhere. Now, what does that mean? That means that somebody along the way has got to find their orange. What is orange? Red is visible risk. And you can see that if you watch the TV in America last night. You saw the red, the visible risk. Now, when you get to orange, it's calculated risk. And we have to find somebody that can do the calculated risk. The guy that had had all that money that was wanting and then wanting to be the next president and then he withdrew, he might be something we, they need to look at again, but they need somebody that can calculate the risk of not doing something and of doing something. So it's the end or carrying on. Me, I talk with my hands. Okay? But everybody is asking for what we call green which in its high form is gorgeous. I think you people call it teal and that's beautiful. I've read some of the stuff Thank about it and it all sounds just to me as I understand green. The yellow will be in the answer. Whatever comes out that would be the yellow answer will do it. But you don't, the testing instruments are not giving you the answer. I remember when Don and Chris brought out the uh, four, uh, eight levels, four quadrants. And I saw this and it wasn't completed. I said, when were people going to complete it? No, they didn't complete it. That was as it was. But that's history. What's going to happen now? There's going to be lots of tears everywhere. John, what do you think? Well, that was a very, um, very big uh, introduction. And I want to kind of, I guess, bring in both the, the conversation about the current breakdown uh, in uh, race and law and order and the pan pandemic. I, I want to look for the connection. And the connection is quite deep, in my view. Yes. So the... I'm my, I, I was introduced as, as taking a fairly radical view and I'm going to present a fairly radical view of um, how I see what's deep underneath the pandemic and then bring that back. 
towards uh, the race issue. For probably about 70 years, ever since uh, the Hiroshima bomb, there's been an underlying uh, sense for the whole of humanity of being vulnerable, of the, the, our, our survival has been at threat all through that time, and it has become increasingly threatened at that deep level by uh, the economic collapse, by the rising awareness of, uh, of climate change, and around all of that, just the whole general level of complexity and uncertainty, all the conditions that people describe as VUCA and that were predicted by Claire Graves back in the 1970s and that he said would be the conditions we would face at some point. Well, we're facing them now. So one of the things that if you are looking at the nature of what the human relationship is with disease, is that diseases exploit psychological vulnerabilities because they affect the human body in ways which connect with our uh, the imbalances that are going on uh, psychologically and in the whole of the kind of the biopsychosocial system. So what we've got is a disease which has come into being in such a way that it has triggered the whole of humanity or the whole of humanity that is aware into having to face how it handles the threat of death and its relationship with fear. And so what we're seeing is everything is being brought down, it was already being pulled down through the uh, stages of the, the value systems in the spiral because of the fear being present before. It has now intensified. So this is a shift into the uh, awareness of the beige and the purple and the red systems, all of which are precognitive and preverbal. So when we take a cognitive approach to the integral view or to the spiral dynamics view, we find it quite difficult to recognize the intensity of what's going on in beige and red and purple. So what has Lorraine just been describing? She has also been describing an eruption from a different cause but it's also an eruption which is showing up in beige and purple and red and in the deep levels of fear and lack of safety and desire to create some kind of security and connection. Because one of the things that we saw with the pandemic was the first response was to start closing borders but the virus doesn't know about borders. So we have this polarity between the desire for people to be safe and to go into their enclaves in a way, and the fact that we have a global problem that is across all those borders. So that tension is also present in the system. So for me, this is the kind of the deeper level of what is going on in the spiral in relation to the existence of the pandemic right now. Yeah. You see, it reflects just as much in South Africa because we believe that Adiba Mandela would help us to, to bridge that, shall we call it gap or differentiation or lots of words you can use. But he really, we looked to him. And there was the beginning of that until the purple started to bring its 
we want a purple person. And they brought a purple person with red tendencies. And you see what had happened to it. So now Cyril has to go in, and you know that I know Cyril from working with the Mine Workers Union for a long time, that he he's thinking much more in blue, and it's high blue, it's not low blue, that he will pull it together. But we face exactly the same thing here, where you always get an instigator running around like you've got in America, and it now the the orange doesn't get the calculated risk people are not when they calculate they working often with a different view than the people who are in blue the one right way god has ordained it's a very it's negative is it a, it can't break out of that, the, the negative side. The positive side is glory and wonder and all the lovely things that happen. But when people go and dismantle the certain of the monuments and things, that is trying to take blue out of the system. And that normally indicates a low purple or low red because we don't go with that at all so i agree with you what have they got to do where does the answer lie of course the answer lies to be always in love thy neighbor but some neighbors are a bit difficult <laughs> and so it's what happens in the neighborhoods. I heard that word today a lot, neighborhoods. In this neighborhood, people came out with brooms and stuff to clean. In other neighborhoods, those are the little shopkeepers, their stuff, but eventually they went to the big shops. And to watch that, that we see it here opportunity and we have not been able to take that energy in the red the positive energy in red and turn it into something to build with I watched some youngsters dive under a, a must have been a curtain or a blonde or something. And they all came out with shoe boxes with running shoes. Nobody knew what size they were. They just had boxes. <laughs> and this was the, the grab. I'm sure they <clears throat> changed out amongst themselves later on. But that need to have something. It's status symbol. You need to also, the value systems are wonderful. If you can look at the dress, how people dress and how they, their whole outside tells you of what is going on in that brain. That's why I think spiral dynamics is so fantastic because in all the studying that I did of the brain, uh, when I heard Claire talk and he talked of these things of how the brain does this and the brain does that. And I'm so sorry he never wrote it all down, but that was what gave us this idea of how things influence your behavior. Behavior, we've talked a lot of, I've been talking to somebody yesterday about I'm okay, you're okay. I'm sure you all know what I'm referring to. And that also comes in to value systems. And Don used that very successfully here in South Africa by showing the purple, red, and low blue of 
how I'm okay, you're okay, how it would make a difference if there was let's take hands and make a new South Africa. And so I remember all those things as well, having been there, seen that, but it is at a higher level of complexity because of the threat of the nature. Look at the storms, look at everything that's happening in nature. It's as if something is saying, come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I don't think I'll ever live. <laughs> There's Rick yeah. talking to us. So you tell me now, because I liked what you said about the thinking within the brain. So there's so much that has happened since Claire's time. I think he would have been absolutely fascinated to see what we now uh, know, what has come forward with epigenetics and the, uh, the sense that, you know, our belief systems can actually start to influence the way that our genes express, that they can, exp they can affect our uh, psychology, psychological expression because we adapt not only as people used to think through the genetics of uh, what happens in mutations between generations, we are now seeing that there is adaptation which takes place kind of on the hoof as, mm. as we move along. And we know so much more because of Candice Pert's work that she published in Molecules in Emotion that we know that so much of what we think of as the brain is actually, that's a body all over uh, mm. effect because it's the messenger molecules that are communicating all the way through between organs, between the blood system, between all the parts of the body being yes. mediated with a, a kind of an intelligence system which uh, holds the coherence of our response. So that also relates back to what is visible uh, and I don't think we've even begun to un unpack what the relationship is between those different hormones. Well, we have maybe a little bit of an understanding of, of kind of endorphins and so on, but the relationships between the hormones and the value systems and what uh, comes to the fore in purple and what comes to the fore in red, those things are happening in the body. And that is, that is the bio system, which Claire knew was there, but couldn't actually show because in, in any completeness he, because he, he, didn't, he didn't have the science that we now have to do that with. Quite, quite. And I think if he had been here now, um, it would have it would be absolutely wonderful i mean i was blessed and fortunate that i could sit and talk to him we talked for a weekend i recorded tape after tape after tape and somebody decided that they needed it more than i needed it and so it's what i've still got in my head and what he shared with Don and what Chris shared with us, Don and Chris and I, we went to lots of places together. And then eventually Chris just was busy fighting fires. And I mean, physically, because he used to have a, a, those dogs with the black spots and they used to run, sit in the back of his truck. And he was a volunteer fireman. So he used to be, be all fighting fires in the summertime or the wintertime whenever you get lots of fires in America. And, but Claire, Claire was looking for something. He was looking for something. And I saw, he said to me, I said, oh, now you're writing all this down. He said, one day I'll sit down and it'll all come clear and then I'll write it all down. 
but that didn't happen. It didn't happen. So each of us, yeah. and I look across people in your grouping and our grouping and everything, and you see there are a lot of young people, but we mustn't forget the older people. We must get what they've got and keep it. Because <clears throat> I, I learned through books, but today you're learning through computers and it's new science. Did you watch the space shuttle? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, we, you know, we, so, so many of us grew up through that. And, and yes, it is different. I mean, you know, what the, the, the thing that we're hearing from you is the, the communication of the stories. And um, the world still tells stories. It just tells them in a, in a different way. But the stories are what, what speak to uh, often some of the parts of our knowing which are um, non-cognitive. And they're often what speak to our purple and our, our, our red yes. because they're speaking below the level of cognitive. But they're awakening aspects of our connectedness. I mean, particularly the purple connectedness that it's possible to speak into into that and um so you know the the there's so much that one of the things i'm i'm wanting to kind of bring into this conversation is the awareness that when we're looking at the shift into second tier what we know is that you know yellow is beige raised to the next level turquoise is purple raised to the next level and in order to have that sense of raising to the next level we actually have to have them strongly within us in the first place and there has been such a focus in the way humanity has developed for all sorts of very good reasons on our intellectual development and our science and our understanding of the kind of the mechanics of the world, all the stuff that Orange is so very brilliant at. But we have also sidelined the extent of our embodied knowing, our inner wisdom, the way that our bodies can speak to us, the use of our intuition, the connectedness that we actually have as, in, as bodies that are embedded in the field of information and that can have a relationship with that. So many of those things have been sidelined by the scientific viewpoint, and we need to bring them back in because the, the solutions to all of our problems, the raising of our collective awareness so that we have a, a stronger sense of, of human bonding so that we have a stronger sense of who we are, have a stronger sense of our relationship with the environment, so that we break through the disconnection that has happened, particularly with the orange system and its exploitation of resources. All of those things are counteracted not simply by a shift upwards, it's the shift downwards in order to pull the depths of our humanity back into full focus and raise them to the, the next level. And that to me is what is needing to be triggered. It doesn't matter which problem you look, like, look at in, in the world. And I think the coronavirus is doing a wonderful job of kind of triggering our awareness of those uh, early stage systems, because that is what we need to be bringing forward. And you know, Lorraine is talking from that perspective because of the depth of that still being so much more real in the African systems than it is in most of the, the Western white world. So, you know, this conversation is, from my point of view, not an accident. The, the reason that Lorraine and I are talking and maybe expressing things in certain what are, have different aspects to the way that we express, but we're drawing on the same thread from my point of view. 
Well, <clears throat> this is so true because I've sort of, because I'm learning how to use this program. You know, when you started, I'm now in, going to be 90 at the end of the year. And to now be able to work on the Zoom and all these things, it's a little bit beyond my, I learned with a slate and a, and a piece of pencil to write and to draw things. So I've been through a lot of phases. But what is, I came across something, the sound. Now, when I do a presentation of the value systems, I go into the sound of everyone that ignites that system. And I'm hearing them using sounds, but I'd really like people to look into what is, go back to basics and look at what are the, what are the sounds that ignite that system. They could do so much with sound vibration with this uh, pandemic that's going on. Is there a sound that's going to put that virus off its trajectory? It's a question I ask myself. Maybe somebody else, maybe John, you need to look at that. In it's, addition, it's, yeah, it's not my good. field of ex expert. I mean, I, I I believe there are all sorts of possibilities um, because because of this of so many different energetic frequencies that have have effects on each other. I don't know enough about sounds to make a comment on that. Yes, well, you know, Elon Musk, Musk who's just it was his design and him that got this capsule up to the space, the American space station in space and he's a South African and we're inclined to when we really get going we look we think outside the box we don't always accept that what we're seeing is what there is and so I'm hoping a lot of people will look at these things will look at spiral dynamics will look into many different things it is so encompassing. It is uh, anything I, every time something new comes out, I take it and I look at it and I think it through and remember what Claire taught me and find new ways of using spiral dynamics in any kind of thing. It's, it's a wonderful thing to have. So, yeah, I don't know if any questions you want to ask, John. Well, I'm I'm seeing a question here from Don, which I would want to maybe yeah. and pick I up think on. It's also, time that people can ask questions. Uh, you know, first you answer yeah. the question, and then from who uh, wants to ask something can unmute themselves and ask. Okay. Yeah. So Don's question if you haven't seen it on the chat is about the reflex actions which cause us to see in the responses to um to, to the to the race issues right now uh we see people responding uh from reflex actions so the unhealthy red reflex action is is kind of violence and destruction and the unhealthy blue reaction which has also a lot of uh, uh of red in it typically um is just to want to um close everything close everything down and put everybody back in their their box without okay. actually dealing with the uh the root issues and I'm going to kind of refer back to what Lorraine said at the beginning to do with, with the presence of the healthy versions of those systems. And what isn't uh, visible to me strongly enough is the healthy red. So where are the, the heroic leaders 
the leaders who don't want to use red for destruction, but who are capable of uh, leading people whose red energy is activated, who are capable of leading those people into uh, more uh, constructive and effective uh, ways of expressing what, uh, everything that they're feeling, which you know, most of us I think would recognise as as a legitimate response, and equally the need for the those in the healthy blue system to rein in the unhealthy blue that uh, was arguably the you know the trigger with with Floyd to the incidents in the first place. So we we just. We just need healthy versions of the systems. You know, it's often the, the conversation goes into kind of, well, do we need second tier? But the core for me of second tier is in its ability to bring into health this first tier systems and to bring in them, them into um, internal kind of horizontal balance uh, within each stage and to uh, bring them more into balance with each other in, in uh, a verticality. So it doesn't require rec raising the entire consciousness of the American population to yellow. And it's, that's just as well because it ain't likely to happen. Yeah. But it does require people from all those value systems to be brought into places where they can articulate the healthy versions of those systems. Yes. <clears throat> And therefore, <clears throat> we need to make as many people aware of them and where they are. And it's amazing when you start to really understand spiral dynamics and you use it, like I've used it when there's been strikes on the mine. And in a strike like that, which is also similar to what you're having in America and in lots of other places in the Middle East, you see it all over. You can work with people if you understand those spiral dynamics and you, you've got to be able to be every system. So you almost transpose yourself and go and meet the person where they are bring them out, go and meet the red, draw a line for red, and you say, you step over this line, I'm going to bust your head. And <laughs> I've done these things, I know. Hey, you, come here, stand here. If you do that again, I'm sending you out. You're not going to stay here. Okay? I've got millions of little stories that I can tell you about this. Like the day they got out of me and I have a Sutu name that they always use. Pusiletsu, you've got to go home today. And I said, no, we're going to still present this afternoon and then I may go, if we do the presentation quickly, I may go home. No, 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 you're going home now. And I said to them, but why? No, we're not going to tell you you go home. So I knew these people. I climbed in the car and I came home, got home, switched on the television, and there was a riot. The Sutus were killing the Corsas. And that is why they had prior notice there was going to be a bust up tonight and they didn't want me in it, which was very kind of them because I would have been right in the middle with 23 thousand black men in Lorraine <laughs> but yes not not a, not a good good place to, to be and I mean you're you know you're talking of of the that aspect of working with the spiral which is about meeting people where they are and I'm seeing Rika's uh, comment the reminder of Claire Graves statement damn it all people have a right to be who they are so our ability to meet people where they are and work with with who they are to find an expression of who they are that is um constructive healthy. and effective and healthy f for them and yes you know you you've just given a, a lovely illustration of the fact that blue 
has to draw boundaries for red because otherwise red just that the energy is impulsive and it spills out all over and you know there's a question in the yeah. in the, the chat wanted... about what what causes the yeah. emergence of unhealthy forms of red or blue that's a big question um i mean some somewhere uh, well you, you'd find it on on my spiral futures dot com website and on academia.com i have a paper which is um really more psychotherapeutically oriented which is about how human beings get damaged in at early age in regard to their relationship to bonding to other people and their relationship with with power and i'm not going to try and unpack all all that if you want to understand how that works by all means you know go and you know, go and have a look at the the papers, because when people are activated very strongly in red and they don't have blue present in their system or their experience of blue growing up was an unhealthy one because they've kind of they, they've just been suppressed from blue rather than brought into healthy blue what happens is that the energy systems are distorted. Now, this I'm not just talking about kind of people who are doing race riots. I'm talking about every human being on the planet. So we all have relationships with ourselves, with our bonding, with our security, with our safety, with our relationship with, with power, which get kind of bent out of, she of shape. And some of that comes into what Integral talks about in terms of, of shadow work. And I don't like the expression shadow, but the, the concept of actually in order to release the energy from our early stages in order for it to be fully manifest and productive in the higher stages, that is actually where we have to go. We have to go back to supporting people into healthy expressions of the core of who they are. I, I, sure Don must be listening, but I want to give you, just in what you've said, Don was asked to do, uh, to get the people in the Dallas policemen, or whatever it's called in America, and uh, to do training to make them more understanding of you know, just where we are now again. And he said this trainer came in and he gave each person an orange and said, now, I want you to take your orange and I want you to get friendly with your orange and start to understand the essence of the orange and I'll come back and you can give me feedback. And so the trainer disappeared and he came back and all there was on the floor was little piles of orange peel. So everybody just peeled their orange and left the peels and said, that's what we think of going into our, our oranges. And it's what's happening in America again now because it's not the kind of thing to be touchy-feely with what's happening. This is where you've got to go in and allow that anger to come out, that red anger. The, uh, also the idea which you get in beige is I'm no good. Beige, you get high beige, which is lovely, but the low beige is I'm no good, nobody can help me. And you have to get in, work with the purple and bring high purple into red, but bring it into high red. It's not that easy to do in groups, but it can be done. And I'll talk to you some more about that, John, at a later stage. <laughs> so um, Juan asks you, can you perhaps tell us why you call the thinking structures human natures. Well, I go back to Dawkins and there are different niches. Niches to me was a lovely way 
remember I was also part of accelerated learning, one of the things that have been sort of pushed to one side, which should be brought out now with the children of accelerated learning and opening parts of the brain to new things in a different way of opening the brain. And uh, worked in art, uh, Brazil at the University de Estado de Rio de Janeiro with some wonderful professors who had done some very interesting work there. And opening people to possibilities within themselves that they'd never seen before. And I've been able to show people their beige, but you want, give me a group of not more than 15, I can't go more than 15, and then one can open them to each system and then they can go and I see there's Marilyn's picture and she's now at Finktorn. Hi, long, long ago, <laughs> Marilyn. <laughs> Hi, Lorraine. Yes, we met in 2000 in Dallas when you were with Dawn. And it was <laughs> the first time I encountered cell dynamics and I met you. <laughs> That's right. I just saw that you'd gone to Flinthorn and I've got a friend who's terribly interested in Flinthorn, so I'm telling her, about some of the early days of Flint Horn. That's yes. women's talk now. <laughs> I just needed to recognize you and I'm so pleased with all the work you've done. Thank you well, for sharing. And I've always admired your work, Lorraine. I'm a great fan and you've taught me a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can, can, can I pick up on two of the questions that are coming in, which I, and I, I want to kind of relate them together. The one, they're at the bottom of the chat um well they <laughs> they they were it's the chat's just moved up and i can't see the questions anymore so um one of the questions was uh asking whether the ideal concern that is being kind of pushed onto everybody you know to be concerned for others when you walk out of the door because of covid and uh, there's a question there about how do you move a group from a healthy purple to a healthy red? So I, um, I, I want to kind of answer, see if I can answer both of those questions. I mean, Lorraine has just talked about, yes, you can work with um, kind of small to medium sized groups to affect a transition, but we're looking at something bigger than that. So what's possible in that arena? And the thing that I would suggest is possible in, in that is that you, you require people to come in with a new narrative. There has to be a new story that people can align around, that they can feel, that they can get to grips with, and that will shift their perception. It'll shift how they see the situation towards a different potential solution or a, a different outcome to the story. So how does that relate to us all being kind of taught to think about other people when we go out the door? There's an interesting, for me, and I, I think there's a paradox in terms of the question that you're asking about kind of, can we raise red and purple to the point where they have a global perspective? Um, my answer is no, I don't think that's possible. I think the lowest level of commonality, which human, hum, human beings are capable of at the moment, is to get to the purple that exists at the level of the nation. So that the response of people coming together and seeing themselves as part of a tribe and as a whole is articulated within the national context. Now, that has been done, I think, quite effectively in some countries, and it's not been done so well in others, and it's possibly been not done at all in, um, in, in, in what happens in, in the USA. But the potential for, for that story to be part of raising 
more people into a, a we system rather than the I system that they're currently locked into. I have the perception that it's not a huge shift. It's not going to be a total transformation of humanity, you know, for the next 10 years. It may be a strong uh, temporary shift that we see for the duration of the pandemic, which is that more people are showing up with uh, questions and attitudes which are taking them from uh, the I system of orange into the we system of, of green. That's certainly visibly happening in the UK. Some of the surveys that I've seen lately that are looking at value systems, not from a spiral perspective, but the but there are some movement movements some relatively subtle, subtle but ne nevertheless strong when you look at the level of this in in the population relatively strong shifts in people's perception even within organizations how they see their position in organizations and what they see what they wish their organizations to facilitate uh, as part of the shift in into the you know the the new reality that is going to come beyond uh, beyond lockdown. I mean, in the UK, we're still in the very early stages of of, um, of, of transiting out of of lockdown. So there are new stories, and the new stories can shift significant amounts of consciousness, but they have to continue over quite a long period for those shifts to become strongly embedded in large populations and all th those of us who have strong green systems we tend to have quite optimistic views of well if people could only see this differently well <laughs> the the reality is that beige and purple and red and blue will see things from beige and purple and red and their blue right way and they won't see what green sees and wants them to see and thinks they could see or should be able to see it doesn't happen that way that is the nature of of the systems within uh, and, the, and the stages within the spiral that's the nature of the ways that those points of view are how individuals have adapted to the reality that they've grown up in and that they've existed in up until january this year uh john in what you say, uh, that awareness of another system, that, that people can see outside their little world or their medium-sized world, what is it? It's sometimes stories, it's sometimes music, it's sometimes we are not, the music that we're hearing today is not the music of before. There's not blue music, not that much. It's all red or purple music that we're hearing. We need to look at, and I'm talking about uh, big chunks, you know, you, you just, I know that certain, but even if I look at China and Japan and Russia, you have the music is loud, it's, uh, it's got a beat, which is the beat of purple, uh, beige at least, but it doesn't go on to, uh, maybe a bit of purple, but you don't get to the uh, land of hope and glory stuff, if you know what I'm talking about. That beat is terribly important. Do we work on the uh, stations, the television stations? Do we work on Hollywood? Who do we work on to get them thinking and playing because it Change comes through experience, as far as I'm concerned. Without experience of it, you just go on jogging in the same street that you've been jogging for the last 10 years. 
Yes. So, I, so I mean, I, I, you know, I, I totally support that idea. In, in order to create a new narrative, it, it's, it has to kind of come through all sorts of media because it has to hit all, all sorts of different uh, ears according to where people are, are listening. And um, I just want to acknowledge a comment from Christine about the difficulty of, of disciplining police. I don't have anything to add to that. I think that's a very accurate description of how things have worked because Green has, to some extent, uh, undermined uh, the discipline of Healthy Blue in, in many areas. And I want to pick up on, on Rika's question and on uh, Marilyn's question about really what does it take to create new thinking structures in humanity and how does that relate to the adaptive systems that were present in the double helix, which you know, is Marilyn's question, that all of the stages that we talk about, they don't just emerge by themselves. They, they're, they're, I often call, call them the, the psychosociological equivalent of Darwinism. They are the way we as humans adapt in our thinking to the conditions that life faces us with. And that, that is, I mean, that is absolutely core to the, the spiral. And it's why the spiral is a four quadrant model. So that, you know, when we overfocus, as, as people have sometimes been encouraged to do, on the upper left quadrant, and on what we can do from within, or, or what we can encourage other people to do from within, it misses the element of how much those internal systems are adaptive responses to what's happening externally. And so if there's no external change, if we're not supporting the external change, then it's very difficult for change to happen. So this question that Rika is asking of, you know, do I, th do I think that changing life conditions will create new thinking structures in humanity? Um, my answer would have to be yes, because that's kind of fundamental to any point of, of view. And I'm sure Rika knew that when she asked the question that you take if you're coming from a, a spiral dynamics perspective. The question then is, how long does that take? And I think it's going to be a really interesting experience over the next one, two, ten years to actually see what the reality of that is right now, because my answer would, would be, I don't know how fast that can happen. I'm rather hoping that it can be quite quick, but it partly depends, I think, on what the people like ourselves who are kind of consciously and intentionally working with other people and with, with systems, how much can we support to happen in that space? How much energy can we put behind the change? So I think it's, a, it's something for us to show as much as it is to kind of just witness and find out about. To me, you'll only get change through... Uh, it's difficult for me to express it. I, I've done it with people so often where and get them to change their thinking. But it takes a challenging them, but not putting them down, challenging their thinking, and very often, particularly in the lower value systems, it has to be like asking somebody, you say, this is a broom, and you sweep with it. But now we haven't got any brooms. How else can we sweep? And you create a difficulty, and they will come up with something new. So it depends. If we can think, and we're thinking ahead, and we're trying to look at all these things, we have to get, we used a coat, a wire coat hanger for years and years. And we get in a workshop, we take out our very rusted <laughs> coat hanger and we'd say, what else can we make out of this? 
and this cult hanger would be bent and would, and what, but, and then we'd say, but you can't do, what can we do with that? Now then this you can do with that, and that you can do with that. And we'd end up with about 20 new coat hanger, jobs for a coat hanger to do. And that sounds very simple and silly. But the pride in the people that had managed to get an answer and to make something else, have we been depriving people of pride in their own abilities? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I look at America today, it's one of the thoughts that struck me. Those people running around screaming, they haven't got pride in themselves. And that to me is the answer to give them back their pride. Yeah, that, I mean, that would be a huge, huge step. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Susan's question. Will, when life conditions evolve as fast as they are now, is adaptation undermined? Um, it's a great question. I, I don't pretend I'm an optimist. So I would, I, I would say it's challenged. Um, but the question is, can we meet that challenge? My, because behind that perception is the fact that all, all of you uh, who are listening to this have been working with, with Integral or with other systems of development. And I mean, some of the people that I recognize here have been doing that for a very long time. And I suspect probably that many of you have been working because in a sense, we have been preparing for these times, whether consciously or not, but we have, you know, we have learned a lot. We have a lot of tools at our disposal. We have a, a lot of awareness that we can bring into the situation. So are we ready to adapt? Well, I damn well hope so. <laughs> and and my, but my belief is, I actually, I believe that. I probably wouldn't be actually here in this conversation if I didn't believe that because I'd go and become a couch potato or I'd, or I'd kind of live out my days on, the, on an island somewhere and, and say, okay, you know, the, let the world go. That's not how I think. That's, and that's how I, I, I hope that's not how we think or how we will choose to think uh, in in the coming years, because I think we're needed. Yeah, well, I I'm at the end of my my career, uh, and I'm looking and seeing. That's why I'm trying to talk to as many people as I can to say there are so many tools around. I, I would learn nothing better than to get on a plane and go to one of those cities and be given the opportunity to run a workshop to put that all together and have a cross section of all of them there. Like I did on the mines here when we had, you know, the unions were standing up place was burning everything and you'd run a workshop and you'd get it all sorted out i mean the one day i took off my boot and i threw it at the one guy because we had just said that's what you don't do and he proceeds to do it so i just took off my boot and threw it at him <laughs> he looked at me he'd never he thought he was a king in his own little world. He never had a woman know how to take him down like it. But he just changed the whole of the attitude. Yes, we're all human beings. We all do funny things. But we need to remember, you said that. He said exactly the same, just in different words. So what makes him special against you? And that is what they're not doing enough of. Yeah, and what I'd like to really hope, uh, what I hope people are hearing and what you've just said, uh, Lorraine, remember that, you know, kind of take yourselves back to the situation that existed when Lorraine was doing the work that she's describing. 
And most of the world believed that it was going to be impossible for South Africa to evolve out of apartheid without, without complete meltdown. Mm. So just see that it requires more people to be doing now the equivalent of what Lorraine did then. You know, this is the value of her being in this conversation is get, get the embodiment of this is what it looks like. This is possible. Here is somebody who worked alongside Don Beck doing the work that he was kind of, to some degree, architecting and describing, and he was doing other parts of it. But it's the fact of getting people to do this on the ground. So the leadership, you know, it, it's not f that somebody is going to come in with this high green or yellow perspective and sort everybody out. It actually requires pulling people up who are within the red system, who are going to provide the healthy red to lead red people and the blue system to provide the healthy blue to read, lead blue people. This is about articulation of what's there. It's not just simply about some kind of big overarching uh, leadership. The, the changes that are going to come in the future, my perception of them is they have to be so much more bottom up. You know, we're used to, to the, kind of, we, we turn governments into mummy and daddy and we expect them or we used to expect them to come and, and f fix that stuff. And that's an attitude or a place of helplessness that we can easily go into when we think that governments or civil services or, you know, all, all the kind of architecture of the state, we think they're going to fix this. This has to shift because so much more has to happen from the bottom up. Yeah. You only you you can't impose change. Change got to be grown. Yes. So now I come in a little bit. How can you make the grow the growth happen so that change can happen? How do you help people to grow? How do you hit little bit at a time? I sit here in a retirement centre and I spend every moment that I'm in to action with somebody by shocking them. And I will say things, the woman will start, oh, it wasn't the breakfast, wasn't nice as well. I say, so what would you have cooked if you were cooking now the same? So I said, so why didn't you ask, could you go and cook breakfast? And then we'd all enjoy it. You know, I challenge them at every point. <laughs> and this is the thing. If we know what we know and we are brave enough, let's not forget courage and being brave enough, we need to get out there in every we are and challenge people. You say you are. You know, people are very keen to tell you who they are and what they are. But challenge them. So thank you for challenging me. <laughs> thank you, John, for challenging me. I don't know what else happens now. You know, I'm still learning the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we can, we have still about 12, 13 minutes. We can still invite somebody to share. But I want at this point really thank you, Lorraine, that you had the courage to come on Zoom several times with me. And we always figured it out how to get you into the room. It was much easier when you had Patricia on your side. She could do that. <laughs> And I really appreciate how brave you are in your age and without ever having worked with this technology to come in now by yourself, just by telephone guidance. That's really absolutely <laughs> admirable. I, I appreciate it a lot. And I think everybody is appreciating that. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah. And John, uh, thank you too. And you made my job really easy <laughs> because you were asking all the questions and were even monitoring the, the, the questions and the comments, which would have been my job. But I'm fine with that, really fine with that. And I see that I'm doing my purpose, which, for which I'm here. I'm here to connect people. <laughs> and I think I have done that uh, successfully. 
but this was a sort of an ending, but it's not yet ended. Lorraine, is it still okay with you if we go ahead? Uh, yes, ending? I just want to say before, you know, you get to the end and then everybody just goes poof and goes away. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, John, it's such fun and lovely to talk to you and to hear your ideas. Uh, perhaps we could do some more of that until oh. I... Until I melt and disappear or go away, we don't know. You know, nobody knows what lies ahead. And But I'd love to knock some things. Of course, I'm still reading all the time and I'm looking at things and I'm thinking of things and there's so much stuff that's coming back to me. And uh, I've been rereading The Aquarian Conspiracy of Marilyn Ferguson. And that's also to go back and look and see and to see what it did and what is going to be the thing now that will make people take their self a little bit further on. I'm sure you've all read that book. Uh, wow, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, 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 long, a long time ago. I barely, uh, I barely remember it. I, I mean, to answer your question, Lorraine, yes, I mean, I, 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 I've... I'm enjoying this conversation you stimulate so so much in me. I mean, I'm enjoying the questions that I'm reading on the the, the chat. So this is a um, a, a complete uh, a complete pleasure. Um, yeah, that I, at this point I can say I invite you to the Wisdom Factory to do more of these things together, and then I publish it on the wisdomfactory.net website, where I have all the previous uh, conversations with you and with many other integral people. Uh, yeah, we will do that, Lorraine. I'm really happy about that. Thank you. Okay, my dear. Nice. Okay, so, so are there any, I don't see questions because I don't think I've touched the right knobs or something. <laughs> no problem. It, it, it's okay as long as one of us is doing doing that. That that's that's good. Yeah, but it's people all, it's can all also, in, in in the and, chat. Uh, uh, but you want to invite people to speak? Yes, sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Who wants to speak? ID, can I please say something? It's sure. here. Yeah? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Hello, John. Hello, Hi, Lorraine. What's up? Hi, Erica. Lorraine, I wonder if you can maybe share with the group and whether you can remember the day at Da Vinci Institute when you walked a blind student of us, the PhD student. She was 64 years old, international journalist, and she travels the world on her own. Uh, but she's blind, so she can't see. So I explained the colors, but I couldn't, when she asked me what is purple and what is red, I had just no insight how to explain this. Can you remember how you dealt with that? Well, I stood up and I acted the colors. I, I can do that. I can go into the value system and be it totally with words and music and sounds and movement because every value system's movement is different. So if I go into a room, I can read who's who in the zoo there. And so this was a surprise to her when we did purple and she felt the purple. And then when we did red and she felt me marching. And then when I was in blue and I straightened her up and made her salutes, and then we got to orange and then I started to count money. So I grabbed something that sounded like clunk, clunk, clunk. But she understood that orange was not just money. Orange is a calculated risk. So put the calculator in her hand. She could calculate with it because she had one with her. And then to look at the uh, green, I just hugged her. And then with the red, I uh, with the yellow, I tapped her on her head. You got to think about it. Yellow is a yellow is very much a several thing. It's uh, yellow doesn't move around a lot. Yellow is much more curl up and read something and understand it. It's a much more uh, internal system. 
And you know, that's as far as I go because I believe that the world is going to, we, we've got such change. We've got the storms, we've got the, the pandemic, we have got them gone to the moon. Uh, they've gone to the space station. We have climate change. We have the terrible drought in places. We have these storms that are washing people away and washing food away. Uh, the world is in a terrible state. Is it going to disappear? I've been reading about Lumeria and how Lumeria disappeared. And that was before Atlantis and then Atlantis disappeared. So the possibility exists that it was. There's no need to be scared of it. Or we might be given the opportunity to fix it as it was done before. And it's a wonderful world to be in. And a wonderful time to be living because there's so many things going to happen. And everybody that's young enough, I think of Ruan and his brother and all the things that are going to be wonderful for them and for your grandson and hope that they're going to find those things out. We all have children or grandchildren or family that is still going to face things. And isn't it wonderful to be alive? I think so. Totally. I don't know who else is there. <laughs> that was a wonderful question, Rika. Thank you for that. Yeah. I'm so uh, admiring your positivity and your, you know, optimism about, you know, I mean, you have a certain age and you're looking into the future with this, it's, it's just amazing. I'm a little younger and I sometimes find myself in thinking, oh, how it, it, will it be going on? And you are just emanating this energy. It's wonderful. Thank you for being here and for being alive and for having done what you have done. And I would invite everybody to unmute yourself. Oh, we still have to do a poll. <laughs> how the session went. I bring it up so you, it will be the last time. It's the last workshop in this uh, conference. So please take a minute and uh, fill that in. So I, I don't have to do anything. Huh? Oh, no, you don't need to do anything. It's fine. No. But I will contact you, Lorraine, and we may, and John, and we do another appointment, maybe in end of June or something. And s stay tuned on the website. You can uh, in my website, the wisdomfactory.net, and you can subscribe for the newsletter. And every week, I send out the newsletter of the upcoming new interviews. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, didn't I didn't Some... launch the poll? Ha! That's the, why because it, it was only on my screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Normally I have a tech host. It's the first time I didn't have a tech host here. So I was not aware of how it works. Oh. Do I have to do it as well? No, you can, but you don't have to. <laughs> okay. I'm not great on answering questionnaires. <laughs> I, I write them. You could make it easy. You could make it easy, Lorraine. Just give yourself fives all the way through. You're excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. That's really sweet. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm also happy that you connected again after such a long time. Yes, it was just lovely. Absolutely lovely. It's been a real... Yes. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so Marilyn, I'm... thank you, all of you. Thank you for listening. And thank you for including me. It it gives me a it gives me a little bounce again uh, because one loses physical ability, but amazingly the brain, although it's got places that I've knocked my head on the floor too often, 
but there's always something interesting happening. <laughs> so here we, we're learning now about this Zoom thing, and that's wonderful too. <laughs> Oh, people, isn't it wonderful? Hopefully we will be like this when we are 90. So <laughs> please uh, express your uh, admiration, maybe with your voice, unmute yourself. And Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank thank you, so thank you John. Much. You were great. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everybody. Bye. And see you next year in Hungary, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> well, Bye. perhaps we can all get together when we've sorted America out, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.